theories may not turn out to be right, although I think more and more people are starting to think there's something to it. So I'm not going to spend, you know, a huge portion of the course just talking about my pet theories. I mean, I recognize that, um, you know, I have to teach partly what's standard. So what I'm so the course is going to be divided in the following way. I'm going to spend. Uh, I'm going to talk about the standard no arbitrage financial theory, and I'm going to talk about it theoretically and mathematically, and from a practical point of view. You know, because helping to run the hedge fund, um, you know, lots of lots of the things that I'll be teaching are things that we actually confront in the hedge fund, and so you'll you'll get the standard financial theory course taught from a hedge fund perspective, both theoretically and from a practical point of view. On the other hand, I've lived now through three mortgage crises. And so it seems silly for me not to describe how the mortgage market works, even though you'll find almost none of that in any standard finance textbook, how the mortgage market works and uh, you know, what's going on and what, what happened in the crises and how we survived and how other people didn't. And I'll talk about the leverage cycle. I'll also spend some time, I think it's quite important, on the mathematical logic of the invisible hand argument. That's the most important argument in economics, you know, that the free market does good for the economy. And a huge number of people believe it. And, and part of that argument and part of the, the sort of hazy knowledge of that argument is what drives resistance to a lot of government programs. I mean, the government can only screw things up is what people generally believe. And is it a prejudice or is there some actual argument behind that? Well, I want to go over that argument and show you precisely how it works and how it doesn't work in, in, in the financial uh, sphere. And then I want to talk about Social Security. That's one more program. That's the biggest program in the budget. It's as big as defense, which and the two of those are much bigger than everything else, uh, vastly bigger than every other thing in the budget. So I want to talk about Social Security and, you know, should it be privatized and should it be reformed and why did it go bankrupt? It's also an interesting mathematical problem because Social Security critically involves the belief that things will go on forever. So there's an infinity in it. You know, each generation, the young, are paying for the old. Nobody would do that if they thought they were going to be the last generation paying to the old. And when they got old, nobody would help them. So uh, Social Security rests on this world going on forever, which makes it mathematically interesting. And anyway, so I got interested in it from a theoretical point of view. And then I got put on all these National Academy panels on Social Security and privatizing. And so I, I know quite a bit about it. So I might as well talk about something I know about. So that's why I'm going to talk about that. All right. So this is too hard for you to read. So let's do this. So let me just give you a few examples. Oops. Uh-oh. I hope I didn't do a terrible thing. No. OK, so let me just give you a, a few examples here of the kinds of, just so you think there's, you realize there's something to the standard theory. There's a lot to it. So I'm going to give you 10 examples very quickly of the standard theory. So these are things that I'm guessing you'll have, at least some of them, trouble figuring out how to answer now. But by the end of the course, they should be totally obvious to you. So um, suppose you win the lottery. $40 million, or it's $100 million, the lottery. Now, they always give you the choice. Do you want to take $5 million a year over 20 years or just get $40 million right now? Which would you do, and how do you think about what to do? OK, that one. OK, so now you get tenure at Yale at the age of 50, say. You're making $150,000 a year, and you think, you know, professors, it's going to go up with the rate of inflation, and that's about it for the next 20 years till you retire. And then, so that's 20 years of that. And then you're going to live another 20 years when you're going to be making nothing. OK, so how much of the 150,000 is, and let's say inflation is 3%. And what you'd like to do is consume inflation corrected the same amount every year, after you retire and before you retire. So how much of the 150,000 should you spend this year, and how much should you save? OK, that's another, you'll learn very quickly how to do a problem like that. OK, now President Levin wrote, a few months ago, the end of last year, if you remember, he said that, well, the, the crisis was bad. You know, Yale was going to weather it, but Yale had lost 25% probably of its endowment. That's $5 billion almost of the $23 billion endowment. So how much should he choose to cut it's his decision? How much should Yale reduce spending every year? Spending, the total spending at Yale is a little over $2 billion. So the endowment goes down by $5 billion. What cut should you take to the budget? 
Should faculty salaries be cut, be frozen? Should, uh, you know, TAs not, you know, should you have three TAs instead of four TAs? Should you, what should you do? How big a cut should you take? Now, the same question faced Yale in 1996 or so, I've forgotten exactly the year, 10 or 12 years ago, the previous president, Ben O'Schmidt, he suddenly noticed that there was deferred maintenance, as he called it. It's a billion dollars to fix the Yale buildings. That's why, incidentally, every year another college gets fixed. They decided there was deferred maintenance of a billion dollars. It had a hundred million dollars over every year for 10 years had to be spent. Uh, the whole endowment then was three billion. And now we had a one billion dollar deferred maintenance problem. The budget was about one billion then. So how much should you cut the Yale budget at that time? So Ben Schmidt said, I'm firing 15% of the faculty. He announced he was firing 15% of the faculty. That was in the front pages of the New York Times, Yale to fire faculty. Well, did, the, did he make the right decision? Rick Levin took over as president three months later, so probably not. But <laughs> what mistake did he make in his calculations? What should he have done? What was the right response? Okay, so we're going to talk about, okay, so that's something you should be able to, so it's not that hard a problem. Um, now, Let's take, a, let's take a, a slightly more complicated one. You're a bookie, uh, and you're, the World Series is coming up. The Yankees are playing the Dodgers, let's say, and you know that the teams are evenly matched, and you've got a bunch of friends who you know every game will be willing to bet at even odds on either side because they're, you know, they think it's, that's a toss-up. Well, one of your customers comes to you and says, He's a Yankee fan. He's sure the Yankees are going to win. He's willing to put up $300,000 to bet on the Yankees, which he loses. So if the Yankees win, he gets $200,000. But if the Yankees lose, he loses $300,000. So three to two odds he's willing to bet on the Yankees winning. Well, you say, this guy's sort of a sucker here. I can take a big advantage of him. On the other hand, the guy's, it's a lot of money, $200,000. I might lose, you know, if I... Uh, if I have to pay off and the Yankees win. So even though I think that, uh, you know, the odds are in my, you know, my expected profit is positive because he's putting up 300,000 to make only 200 when they're even odds. In fact, the fact is it's such a big mo number, I don't, you know, I'm a little worried about that. So what do you do? So what can you do? You've got these friends who are willing to bet at even odds, each game by game. So how much money, presumably the first night, you're going to bet with one of your friends you take the guy's bet, the customer, you, you take his 300,000, you promise to deliver him 500 back if the Yankees win, and to keep it if the Yankees lose. What should you do with your friends? Should you bet on the Yankees with your friends? Should you bet on the Dodgers with your friends? And how much should you bet at even odds the first night? Okay, so that doesn't, so the answer is, well, I, I don't want to give all the answers now, but so there's a way of skillfully betting with your friends and not betting 200 or 300,000 the first night with your friends at even odds, you bet some different number than that, which you'll figure out how much to bet so that if you keep betting through the course of the World Series, you can never lose a penny. Okay, but how do you know how much that is? Well, that's the kind of clever thing that you're going to, you know, these finance guys uh, developed and you're going to know how to do. So let's do another example like that. Uh, I'm running out of time a little bit, but one an example. Suppose there's a deck of cards, 26 red and 26 black cards. Somebody offers to play a game with you. They say, every time, if you want to pick a card and it's black, I'll give you a dollar. If it's red, you give me a dollar. So if I'm picking, I get a I'm in the black, I get a dollar. It's in the red, I lose a dollar. I have to throw away the card after I pick it. And the guy says, by the way, you can quit whenever you want. All right, so should you pick the first card? Looks like an even chance of winning or losing. Let's say you pick the first card. It's black, you win a dollar. Now the guy says, do you want to do it again? The deck is 26. You picked a black one, so there's 26 red left and 25 black. So it's now the deck is stacked against you. Should you pick another card? Well, it doesn't sound like you should pick another card, but you should pick another card. And, and I can even tell you how many cards to pick. Even if you keep getting blacks, you should keep picking and picking. So how could that be? It sounds kind of shocking. Well, it's going to turn out to be very simple for you to solve uh, halfway through the course. So let's suppose, let's, uh, let's a more basic question. Let's suppose that you, you know, there are 30-year mortgages now you can get for five and three-quarter percent interest. There are 15-year mortgages you can get for less, like 5.3 percent interest. 
on one's lower than the other. Should you take the 15-year mortgage or the 30-year mortgage? How do you even think about that? Why do they offer one at a lower price than the other? Um, okay, one more example. Suppose you're a bank and you hold a bunch of mortgages. That means the people in the houses, have, you've lent them the money. They're promising to pay you back. And you value all those mortgages at $100 million. The interest rates go down. The government lowers the interest rates. Half of them take advantage to refinance. They pay you back what they owe, and they refinance into a new mortgage. So now you've only got half the people left. Let's say all the people had the same size mortgage and everything. Half the people are left. Is that shrunken pool half as big as the original pool? Is that worth 50 million, half of what it was before, or more than 50 million, or less than 50 million? How would you decide that? Again, this is a question which might be a little puzzling now, but actually you should be able to get the sign of that today even. And, um, and we'll start to analyze it. So that's what mortgage traders have to do. They see interest rates went down, a bunch of people acted. The people who are left in the pool are different from the people who started in the pool. Now we've got to revalue everything and rethink it all. So how should we do that? Okay, um, let's say you run a hedge fund and some investor comes to you and says, oh, things are terrible. Look at all the money you lost for me last year. Um, you know, I know you're doing great this year and you've made it all back that you lost last year, but you know, I don't want to run that risk. So I want to give you a mon my money, a billion dollars. I want to get these superior returns you seem to earn, but you have to guarantee that you don't lose me a penny. I don't want to run any risk. I want a principal guarantee, it's called, that when I give you $100, I'll never have, uh, you'll, you'll always return my $100 and hopefully much more, but never less than $100. So is there any way to do that? Or you know, you know that you're, you've got a great strategy, but of course it's risky. You could lose money. You've lost money a bunch of times before. So how can you guarantee the guy that he'll get all his money back and still have room to run your strategy? Well, it sounds like you can't do it, but of course a lot of people want to invest that way, so there must be a way to do it. So, You'll figure out, we'll learn how to do that. So, uh, three more short ones. A scientist discovers a potential cure for AIDS. If it works, he's going to make a fortune. He started a company. It's a Yale scientist. He's medical school, started this startup company. Yale, of course, is going to take all his profits. But anyway, he's a startup company. <laughs> and if his thing really works, he's going to make a fortune. If it doesn't work, it's going to be totally zero. You calculate, and let's say you believe your calculation, that the expected profits that he'll make if it works, you know, the probability of it working times the profits, that expected profit is equal to the profits of all of General Electric. Should his company be worth more than General Electric, the same as General Electric, or less than General Electric, since it's got the same expected profits? Well, I can tell you the answer to this one because I think most of you would think, first you'd think, well, maybe the same. Then you'd say, well, this AIDS thing, it's so risky. It's either going to be way up here or nothing, and that's so risky, and General Electric is so solid, probably the, the General Electric is worth more. But the answer is the AIDS company is worth more. So how could that be? So uh, another kind of, uh, another question. Suppose you believed in the sufficient market stuff, and you rank all the stocks at the end of this year from top to bottom of which stock had the highest return over the year. It's 2010. Let's say 2010. This year is a weird year. So let's say you do it in 2010. All the stocks, the highest return to the lowest return. Now, suppose you did the same thing in 2011 with the same stocks. Would you expect to get the same order, or the reverse order, or random order? Now again, if you believe in efficient markets, and the market's really functioning, the prices are fair and all, I'll bet most of you will say, you won't know, but you might say should be random the next time because, you know, firms only did better or worse by luck. But that's not right either. So you're going to know how to answer that question by the end of the class. Um, okay, one last one. The Yale Endowment over the last 15 years has gotten something like a 15% annualized return. A hedge fund that I won't name has gotten 11% over the last 15 years, counting all its losses and stuff like that. So. Is it obvious that the Yale endowment has done better than the hedge fund? Would you say that the Yale manager is better than the hedge fund manager? Its return was 15%. The hedge fund only got 11%. So I'm asking the question, um, and I would say that David Swenson would think about it the same way I think about it. So um, suppose I even told you that 
the Yale hedge fund had lower volatility than the, not the Yale hedge fund, the Yale endowment had lower volatility than the hedge fund, um, which it surely does, would that uh, convince you now that the Yale endowment had been managed better than the hedge fund? Well, we're going to answer this question again, and you're going to see that the answer is a little surprising. So, although it won't be so surprising, I wouldn't have brought it up.